Hey, everybody. Today, I have two fabulous comedy creators with me. I have Sachandrika Chakrabarti and Noreen Skinner. And um, I'm going to be talking to them about creating topical comedy, which is such a fun area to explore. And to introduce them a little bit, Sachandrika is a stand-up and also return guest of the show. I had her back on the podcast in season one, I think it's episode three. And so much has happened since then. She runs the monthly night Good News, Bad News in North London. She writes for BBC One's Have I Got News For You? And she's going to be returning to the Edinburgh Fringe Festival this year with her second solo show, Doom Scrolling, which we touched on in our first episode and she has been doing so much with since then. And also making joint work. Uh, so we're going to dive into that soon. But also, I, I can't uh, uh, begin without uh, letting you know this fun fact that Sachandrika shared that actually she was asked to be on the first season of the popular TV show, The Traitors, and she turned it down. So, Noreen, I'm going to introduce you in a moment, but I can't just brush over that. What <laughs> happened? How were you asked? Why did you turn it down? Tell me all the things. So, um, I got an email. It was just, I was being asked to audition. So, I think for okay. the first season of The Traitors, it was like an open casting call. It, anyone, I think, in the country, probably, probably UK, um, could apply to audition mm. but I think they were looking possibly for comedians because like we could sort of get up and go and um we used to just talking to people possibly you know certain demographics they wanted um but I just got the email and I was just like I don't want to do reality tv this sounds like a nightmare they're like you mm. get to live in a scottish castle for two weeks some people are traitors some people are faithful there's a cash prize and I was like absolutely not I'll be right. this generation's nasty Nick it will all go oh. wrong I'll get cancelled <laughs> Noreen's like yes you will and, um, <laughs> you will get cancelled and I was just like and I was just not in a great headspace and um I was just like no and so I just said oh not for me thank you and I know from another comedian actually who got the same email I think mm. that she did audition or had an interview um but then they didn't come back to her afterwards so yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, it could have gone very right or very wrong. And yeah. then people obviously, the response to most people is, did you go back to the second series? They mm. don't respond to my emails now <laughs> because they don't oh. need to. <laughs> <'Cause it's laughs> I think part of that mistake, perhaps, has led to the show that Noreen mm -hmm. and I have. I want to make right what once went wrong. <laughs> yeah, and I can't wait to dive into the show. And it is uh, related to the traitors and also to uh, something else that we're going to pick up on when we uh, introduce Noreen. So welcome, Noreen Skinner, too. Lovely to have you joining the show. Uh, Noreen is an actress, comedian, divisor, improviser extraordinaire. She recently went viral with her Liz Truss parodies that have received millions of views on YouTube uh, and also is going to relate to the work that we're going to talk about soon. So very fun. Um, interestingly, she is a Funny Women Awards finalist. Uh, shout out to Lynn Parker, who we had on the show, who's the founder of Funny Women. And Noreen was a finalist for Content Creator, which is fabulous. And also, she reached the semifinals of Britain's Got Talent with her comedy cabaret trio, The Dots, which uh, just, I, I watched a clip online and I was like, how did I miss this? This is so <laughs> fun. <laughs> and Noreen will also be going to the Edinburgh Festival uh, this year with her solo show, which will be debuting. So, so much to ask about as it relates to making work and particularly topical comedy. But what I want to start with is your joint project. Um, such a fun concept. For uh, listeners, could you tell us a little bit about what that concept is and how it came about? And I'll throw that to either of you. Uh, yes, well, thank you so much, firstly, for having me on the show. It's really lovely to, to be here. Um, uh, it's Noreen, by the way, just in case you're confused about which voice you're hearing. <laughs> um, okay. um, yes, yeah, so I, well, we, we met, both of us met on, it was a good news, bad news, wasn't it? That's how we, we met, wasn't it? Yeah, so um, we were kind of aware of each other online, I think. We've been at the same fringe festivals. You get to like know everyone's face and poster and mm. you see them on Instagram, you see them online. And then it was the day Liz Truss had announced that book, 10 Years to Save the West. Incredible. And um, because the, the mix Bill Knight is very, like, topical. Mm. And I just thought I'd message Noreen because, I don't know, we, you, we had a good feeling about each other, didn't we? And I was like, oh, do you want to come down and, and do, like, a bit? And I'll interview you about the book and it'll just be fun. And um, Noreen lives just slightly outside London, but sort of said, I'll, I'll come back in and do this. And we sort of did a little, little improv in it you know when you have good chemistry with someone you know when it works and mm. like your Liz I mean the impression was great I already knew that but like your Liz 
is so um is not a pushover like there was a lot to work with and like mm. we went for like 10 minutes and we literally just met um yeah. so I felt like a good sign to me definitely that was really fun yeah, it was really lovely because it was just, like you say, I think it's very rare when you kind of meet someone and you get on immediately with having not known them. But like you say, having this, that social presence. But because I'd been doing so much of the Liz stuff and then you'd also been doing uh, Claudia or like the, the idea around around that. And you told the story about the traitors and what you just explained. And it was a near miss and it was so popular at the time. Um, that we just felt like there was this world where we could merge the two together mm. and create a really fun like, who done it show <laughs> with Liz Truss and loads of different characters that don't necessarily even have to be political. So it seemed like a too a too good thing to to miss, really. Mm. And oh, so many things I want to ask you about. Um, but I'm going to start with like you mentioned, it's a, a who done it show now and it's in the form that you're currently working on so I'm curious like how much you're thinking about how you're trying to structure it for the audience and the interactivity and where you're kind of leaving space for like you both talked about that so the improvisation element where are you currently in uh like what that balance looks like really discussing uh, it yeah yeah exactly that it feels like we we keep discussing it don't we and then changing our mind um which is always a natural process with any creative element but I, I don't know if you would agree it seems like we've now got a sense of okay everyone does their little bit which they can control and mm -hmm. they know what that is so they're presenting something to the audience which is almost their case as to why they were not responsible for the downfall of the economy or uh, you know they can plead their case so there's a section that's quite um, structured and then the second half will lead to the audience being able to ask questions. I think that's where we're at. Am I wrong? Have I got it all wrong? <laughs> Probably. <laughs> you try to, um, yeah, no, it's it's that kind of thing that you want everyone to shine and have loads of fun and do the improv. And, and then you want the audience to feel like they're participating. I think there's something about the interactivity that makes live performance really exciting for audiences like mm. maybe in sort of a grim time where the cost of living crisis I think is biting even harder than ever um yeah. to really get people out and, and show them a really fun time um yeah we just want the audience to be part of it like with good news bad news as well when the audience mm. not talks back it's not quite the word because they're really nice audiences but they're often really politically engaged they're often really um very knowledgeable but like when they just come along to have fun and be silly I think that's when there's the best energy in the room and so we're just trying to yeah try and recreate that with this sort of like semi-improvised semi-structured sort of game it's an experiment um people think, like the concept which is fun sorry um mm. people laugh when they hear the concept and we just want to keep that sort of feeling going I suppose yeah it's also interesting that um I, I was discussing this with another comedian recently about everyone's um uh, interest or the short term, like the, you've only got a couple of minutes to impress. <laughs> it doesn't, I think, because people are watching so many TikToks and mm. reels that are 20 seconds or less, that the interactive element seems to be becoming even more and more important and necessary in theatre or um, comedy. So to be able to have, it, it's, it seems like loads of murder mysteries are becoming, are blowing up at the moment and they're, mm. they're very fun. So to be able to mix a bit of the politics with the the fun of traitors and the reality tv with that interactive it feels mm. like it could be a um, really fun thing that is engaging for everyone mm. yeah that makes total sense and um i want to ask and it's not a, a super easy question but where do you where are you getting your fuel for the topical element and in a way that doesn't just uh, drive you mad I mean, so th this might be my <laughs> own projection of thinking about like trying to deal with social media and different things. But what are you using as the sources for like that topical element? And how are you managing uh, that relationship in terms of still being a creator and still being able to kind of go about your day without feeling fried? We touched on this a little bit with doom scrolling, didn't we, Sir Chandra mm -hmm. back in the first show? So I'll ask you first, Sir Chandra Yeah, I suppose that um, I... I love the news is a really odd thing to say. What oh. I find what I find I've always been able to do with the news is like find the ridiculous in it. Okay. Um and the ridiculous I mean, to be honest, a lot of a lot of what drives me with topical comedy is rage, is like this is wrong mm. what's happening. 
this is a terrible government. Um, there are so many things happening because of cuts that shouldn't be happening. People are suffering. Um, people should have their dignity. So it's actually like absolute fury, but I can't mm. get on stage and rant. That's just not, I think people shut down. I don't think that's my style, but I think when you make people laugh, even if people believe different things, it just changes the atmosphere. They're more willing to be open. They might not change their mind, but I think they, they're more willing to listen. And so that really drives me is to try and like get past division or tribalism when it comes to politics. And, and I find the facts, to be honest, this particular government has come up with so many absurd characters. Mm. I think the only way to go is to push it further and make it more surreal and more ridiculous. Um, because otherwise it just feels like a lesson in the news. And I don't think people want that. I think they're very tired. They're switching off in the news. And so I see topical stuff as a shorthand, like Liz Truss as a type of, you can take Liz Truss as I'm, what you're presenting to me is this terrible person who tanked the economy fine. Or you can see her as a type or a type of Tory or like people can see her as a character or her as a theme or her as a symptom if you do it in comedy as opposed to doing it really straight. So I'd say that for me it is like, yeah, I, I'm, I think things should be different. I feel that very strongly, but the only way I feel I can get that across without sermonizing is comedy. Mm. Um, so that drives me not a not a gender a very heavy answer there like no, but it's but just that's, the truth yeah no that's helpful that's what we want it's just the truth and how about mm. um for you Noreen so I was asking about like what the fuel of it and how you kind of manage that relationship uh with whatever it is where you get your uh news from yeah well for me I've come from it from a slightly different angle I think because I actually used to steer away from politics in my comedy because mm. I didn't feel like I ever really knew enough about it and um, I found that it was, well, it is so hard to keep up with it. <laughs> Every day there's something new. And so I steered away from it. And then it was just Liz Trust that made me kind of go down that direction because I was interested in her from, like you were saying, Sassandra, about the, the, her character. Mm. Uh, that's what uh, really drew me in. So I always look at characters first and see what or who they remind me of. And that's my impetus for then creating something. So I... I'm less of it, but I think probably my own uh, insecurities of, of not feeling like I still know enough about the political world that if I go from it from that angle. Um, so I, I wait for something to inspire me. But equally, it's very difficult because, like I say, you, it's hard to keep up with everything that's going on. And even when I think, oh, I'm going to do something on this particular situation that's happened, uh, by the time I've gone to film it, something else has happened. <laughs> something new has happened. So I think that's quite the thing that's quite useful for our show in particular is holding on to things that we know, particularly maybe about Liz. Um, for instance, she loves cheese. <laughs> she loves pork. Um, all the things that maybe the wider majority of people do know that they can relate to about her that even if we have to add in new stuff because the news has moved on, that we have those to bring it back to a uh, a stable place that people can relate to because not every I that's what I'm realizing is that not everyone knows the intricacies of these these characters it's only from when we've done the research on them so you forget sometimes if people aren't so political that they might not know so it's nice to have general moments within it as well yeah that's really good advice and I want to ask both of you about character comedy as well and where it fits uh, with that so I'm going to ask about the Liz Trust piece first um any tips for people who maybe like they they are interested in a particular character that's in the news, but they are kind of nervous of doing that because maybe they don't consider that they're an impersonator or um, they haven't actually tried that before. Any tips for kind of grounding something or making something work when it is a real life person that people can look at footage of and may see in the news? I'll ask Noreen first. And then we'll come on to Claudia Winkleman. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's a really good question because I remember when I first started, I felt really out, out of my depth because my friend actually said I should do it as a joke. Um, mm. And um, then it blew up overnight. <laughs> um, but I think that 
if you've got something that you're intrigued by, that just to do it and, you know, you can you just see what happens because even if you don't feel overly that confident, it could be the key to opening something else. And if it is a particular character, just looking at their mannerisms or the way that they speak, it, uh, what I've learned is I would never really necessarily call myself an impressionist. I just mm. happen to look a bit like Liz in the first instance and the voice and everything has come over time but it's wildly exaggerated um and I wouldn't say I'm as close to any of the other characters that I do as I as I am to her so I would say I'm a more of a parodist um mm. and I think that that's a really lovely thing that people uh, I would I would encourage people to do is if you find something that inspires you even if you sound nothing like them it could just be an observation that you've picked up or even the way that they move their eyes that that could be really funny to someone because they hadn't realized that they'd picked up upon that uh on that observation um so yeah just just go for it I think and, and not worry and don't try not to do what I do and get stuck because I ended up just becoming Liz Truss so I now <laughs> need to find other characters <laughs> okay yeah uh, that, that makes sense and also yes for all kinds of reasons I love it and as uh, Sushanka I'd love to ask you as well like um character comedy your experience with it what's drawn you to it what's been fun and I've seen pictures online of you as Claudia <laughs> Winkleman <laughs> <laughs> I think um, what we've started with is the harrowing story of how Noreen has become Liz and it is yeah. terrifying so give it a go but <laughs> when, will will it end? when will it end <laughs> um, <laughs> I, yeah, I'm, so, I'm so sorry to make this even worse for you Noreen um, I uh, yeah, started getting into character comedy I suppose like um, how did I begin what was I doing um, oh, to, be, to be fair I do think with stand up I've always been playing a character but I haven't been telling mm. anyone I was doing it and right. Um, this kind of aunt character, like my, my very first set ever, which I did at the end of the course I did at Bill Murray back in 2020, I was like giving advice about dating to my niece who was three or four at the time. And so it's a fun concept to like mm. give this wildly inappropriate. When I say inappropriate, I mean, I was speaking from, from the standpoint of someone who listens to Chimney True Crime podcasts. So I was like, right. they're all murderers. This is how you watch out for a murderer on a date. And it's funny because it's like too much to tell a child. But I was like, but mm. also it's so far from what I would ever say to her, this is a character. Why am I not? Because I had a, an idea of what I'd be as a stand up. And I was like, I've come from mm. journalism. I'm really mm. straight, for me, factual uh, microphone. And I think, you know, as Narina said, like you should give things a go and allow yourself to, to break out of that box that maybe you put yourself in oh I'm only allowed to be this kind of comic because I've come from here well nobody's nobody's saying that and so I was actually like I think I'm playing characters I think this persona is so far from me number one mm. I should tell people because they might think that is me <laughs> um, but also <laughs> yeah. like what is she saying to her niece but also mm. like is this is this fun so I definitely I'm not an actor I'm not trained and so I definitely feel that like anxiety about about trying to sort of play in the same playground as people who are but then something about this show that I'm so glad I asked Noreen to do this with me is that and I know she'll be like no but like you want someone who does a really good impression the way you do or, or parody I like what you said about parodies I think that's that's right but you mm. do capture something like Liz and the way she talks and holds her head that is so correct I've not seen someone do it better and then my Claudia Winkleman is terrible <laughs> and that's fine because mm. I think when you've got someone who's good and we've got other people in the cast who are good as well I don't think the show has to have this but I think it raises it a level when you've got people who've got those skills and can do it really well my claudia is a wig with too much fringe and <laughs> I, I've got, we've got some hoods <laughs> and i think that it makes it funnier that mine's not good all my characters are basically me with a wig on and one whale mask <laughs> and i'm not i can't do oh, I, I have an elmo i tried to do an elmo voice someone was like lean to the elmo voice more so um i'll try but um i think my character comedy is almost meta in terms of I know I'm bad at it and mm. so I'm kind of like I'm doing this for my knees and that's what like, doom scrolling's become that I'm like trying mm. out character comedy in the show I don't I tease people with it and like don't put on the props until late and um yeah I think I think it makes it funnier that my Claudia is just a woman who's basically trying to fully cover herself with hair mm. um and nothing else I, I can't do the voice I can't do anything but I think you you don't need that much from Claudia because um, like, I remember Noreen retweeted the picture of like us from the, the to, to market the show. And someone said, oh, is that, is that Claudia Winkham? Like, yeah, is that a version of Claudia mm. Winkham? And it's like, great, people are getting it. That's mm. all you want. So I think we had this conversation the other day, Noreen. Um, someone said to me, I can't remember who, it's like, if they're thinking, they're not laughing. And I think that's a huge problem with topical. Mm. There's a huge mm. problem with the way I write, which is often like 25 ideas in one sentence. And um, yeah, like, 
always been like that. And so if someone's already visual, like for me, I've learned a lot more about like visual comedy and physical comedy. So now when I go up to stage, I'm five foot three, often the mic is a bit higher because, you know, lots of men on lineups and I'm not tall. And so I, instead of asking them to move it for me, I'll, I'll like go up and be like, oh, 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 and like just just do that. And just if you can get a laugh without opening your mouth, mm. that just builds that rapport already. And I think that's such a gift that people who sort of know about physical comedy and character comedy, they already have that. And, um, and then landing endings as well. I'm wondering if growing into a character in the show, so letting people see me do that, if that's mm. getting a good laugh. And yes, that's where I am with it. I, I don't know if I'll ever be much good at character comedy, but it can get a laugh without me having scripted a line. Mm. And that for me feels like a good way. So I'm improvising a lot more and doing character and having a lot of fun with it really. Yeah. That does sound so fun. <laughs> and I, I love that um, you both being so honest about like clearly you both have like such strengths that you're bringing from your different background and that'll be true for all listeners. So whether it's like from journalism and all the massive skill set that goes into that and that uh, relationship with politics or whether it's training in theatre and comedy, but then we always as humans and look at the bits that we're like, but I don't have that and they have that. So maybe I shouldn't, you know, I'm not a journalist, <laughs> I'm not this. So it's lovely to kind of hear that that's true for everybody and we're all kind of bringing Bringing that to it and what how fun to um make a like a joint collaborative project where you get to share that and also um, you're having guests on the show I believe could you say a little bit more about that because I think that sounds very fun what's that going to be like how are you going to manage those relationships we've got um we, well, we've, we've got a selection of guests um and the idea is that each of them will come on and present their their case so mm. they'll get a good you know five to to 10 minutes each um and what's really lovely about it is because they're all um really very different in their skill sets so like we were just talking about um that that we know that they're going to bring something amazing to it um we may have more than one liz truss we may have more than one nadine dorries or um you know there's (laughs) there's options and the good thing is because everybody's so versatile that they we've kind of left it open at the moment that they Mm. can discover they might want to be one character, they might want to play two characters, or maybe they might just want to get up and do some stand up or, or maybe for some reason, there's a non political character that just pops up who uh, has nothing to do with the night, but is there. (laughs) Um, Or some songs as well, because uh, Mm -hmm. everyone is so, uh, like I was saying, versatile, and they've um, you've got people who can sing really well, um, or improvise sing really well. Um, So I feel like, it, it's going to be a really fun night full of very different uh, different styles. And I think that's always really interesting from the audience and keeping their attention span as well. Yeah, and which is a real thing. Uh, so, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, so I love that you're uh, engaging with that. And do you mind me asking how you um, selected those people? Because there'll be uh, listeners at all different points in their career, some in the UK, some in the US, or different kinds of environments. But like, is that from people that you... Um, know from other comedy nights that you've done relationships you built online like how are you sort of selecting those people if I could ask that to Suchentrica yeah all of these things um it's people I've been on we we haven't like announced people on social media yet but we we Mm. will um yeah people I've gigged with um people I kind of have an online relationship with and I've seen their work but I haven't necessarily worked with them have I even in real life met everyone possibly not one person um, mm. but I'm still aware of what they do and um, lots yeah. of improvising like I think that's what we really wanted and thought like they'd have the most fun is people who are very happy to get up and not be scripted but to just bring their own stuff um, people who make me laugh as well people who I um, I enjoy their comedy and and would love to be around them and work with them so yeah I think both both of us sort of like um, discussing discussing people but really landing on like we have the same ideas of people who are like, yes, 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 it's got to be them. And and then just hoping they were free and wanted to do it. So mm. I think we've been quite lucky with who um, yeah. said yes. So it, yeah, it's worked out. Perfect. And um, not necessarily an easy question, but is there anything that you feel is sort of off limits in terms of, because you want, you know, you've talked about it being um, really fun and fun for the audience too. Are there any conversations that you've had behind the scenes about things where you're like, that's just off limits or is every, 
I mean, it's not an easy question, but uh, and, you, and that might not have come up, or is it really just about how it's dealt with, like just in terms of what you're prepared to draw on from uh, topical comedy and the kind of things that happen in the news? I don't know if that's possible to even answer that question. So, it's a really good point, actually, because we haven't had that conversation. So oh. thank you, Danielle, because <laughs> we can have it now. No. <laughs> no. Yeah, no, no. I don't know, actually, is there? So I, so I, um, I, I take a lot of my experience from good news bad news i know it's not the same kind of mm. night yeah. but it's it's kind of like hosting and having lots of different people along and with obviously with that kind of theme where i say like bring along a new story from the last month and just mm. say the headline and have a reaction that's kind of minimum all the way up to if you've got like a really newsy set you know mm. all new materials all good but um i kind of go with trust that they're not going to get into a new story that is impossible to make comedy about um yeah. like certain wars going on in the world and I haven't had to say anything and I think that's mm. partly because I'm not looking for the quote-unquote sort of edgelord com- comedians um I don't know any of them personally it's not my style of comedy um I'm really more looking for people who've got an inventive approach to things mm. um yeah, and I've I've not seen many people on the circuit kind of try to do jokes about really serious things going on in the world right now. I, th- I think this. I think people do understand. I think I feel like the people we work with aren't trying to. You're yeah, not trying to shock, and if there is that kind of comedy, and um, yeah, I don't. I find I work much more with. You can call it more gentle humour if you want, but. Actually, people can still get dark and get ridiculous, but I think it's more, I love like a surreal kind of approach. And yeah, I've, I had that in my head, like, should I be saying this to people, like keeping it within limits or like, but I've not, and no one has sort of gone over the bounds of taste in my opinion. And no one's complained mm. to me or anything. So I've been running good news, bad news since last November. Um, I do think people have a strong sense of, what could be joked about and what is helpful to joke about as well Mm. Uh, really current serious situations just aren't funny you could you could say this of a current political situation it's not the same thing but i think there's a resistance involved when we laugh at our powerful political leaders that's our form of resistance and that's Mm. something we're existing within and so we we have a stake in the society and we can laugh. It's not the same as the serious wars going on in the world. Um, yeah, that's what it's felt like to me. I've never had to say anything. Also, I don't feel anyone's even tried to make those sorts of jokes at the nights of rum. Yeah. Yeah. It's- and that probably says a lot for how you're hosting the event as well and the environment that you're setting up and the tone that you're setting as a leader in that space, which is awesome. And um, sorry, I want to come back to you in a second, Arena. So I wanted to ask you one follow-up question uh, about the good news, bad news, Sitantrika, just because you have been doing it and you have been seeing all these other comics come through and participating uh, in that evening. And um, I don't know if it's even possible to say, but without naming names, just like on a sort of uh, like bird's eye view level are there any particular things you think you've learned from watching all those different people and how they've treated topical comedy that you think oh that's a really good idea or "Mm, I might avoid that or is that hard to say because everyone has their own different styles I really like having a lot of different styles something I thought was really fun was somebody came along and they did personal good news and bad news and I thought it was a really fun twist the audience really liked it um it fit with their persona who was like I don't know, like it's like anxious millennial kind. It could be them as well, but um, I felt like it was a persona. And I thought mm. that was very cute. And I've suggested that to people. It's like people sometimes get a bit worried about like topical comedy. And mm. one thing I really want the night to be is like a complete sandbox. I want any comedian who I'm asking to be part of it or who's approached me to feel there isn't a bar to get into this night. Like it's, it's playtime, oh, it's fun. Nice. So if you're worried mm. about the topical stuff like literally just name it name a news headline or i do a really topical like intro when i mc um i name mm. loads of news stories or i do a character cruella braverman i was captain tom's mm. daughter for a long time cause, again like it's not about going in on her because she's a private individual she's not elected to public office but there's something that really captures the image she's very memorable 
I think my favorite thing is she's a PR, but she has ter- a terrible public image. And I think that's mm. just very human. Yeah. Um, and I think if you go in and you're going, you're finding the human thing. So we, she's Captain Tom's daughter, but what I'm actually joking about is this person who's got themselves wrong. And so then in my interpretation, she's now trying to become a comedian and then she writes jokes to chat GPT. And so you just, you take the human thing about them and remove it from them. And then it's not really about joking about her. Um, so yeah, I think, I think from watching other people, I've learned a lot more about, like find that emotion, maybe find the relatable mm. human thing in them. And you can remove that from, the person in the headlines who's naturally been reduced to just like one or two qualities. Um, also the use of music. I find if your character mm. entrances, changes, exits, um, how you use music to kind of keep the audience going when there's dead air, quote unquote dead air, that's been great to watch. And that's taught me a lot. Mm. And yeah, just getting a laugh without saying anything. I'm always, I love watching that and thinking, how can I how can I use that basically? But there have been so many great acts come through. Like it's been a joy to run this night. It's really fun. Oh, so many great tips in there. I love it. And Noreen, sorry, I interrupted you. Is there anything that you wanted to add? And if not, no problem. I'll ask you another question. Oh, uh, no, I think I think it was just off the back of you saying about um, characters and uh, things you can't touch upon as such. I think you kind of just said it there. I think when I'm looking at characters, I try and... Um, I try and just look at the the mannerisms or look at a situation and I never do it with bad intent towards the the person because I always realize that ultimately whatever is going on that they're they're a human and they've got everyone has their own things and you know we never know what what is happening behind closed doors or or whatever um regardless so I'm always really aware of that and I think that most I feel like I don't know if uh, if you feel this too but I feel like most people uh, most comedians uh, have that intention of uh, or awareness and um, especially if it's character stuff I almost feel like you can hide behind a character more sometimes so that actually you can um, get away with more especially controversial stuff and if you are if you have got a message that is underneath and you feel passionate be it, uh, that you want to get that across mm. um, it's much easier I've got a conspiracy theorist character that I've got who isn't political at all but mm because he talks like that and he can just say what he wants he can just say what he wants and it's not controversial but um if i was to say that as me i'd probably uh get shut away somewhere but it, it, it there's something about that freedom which i think is really nice for an audience as well to explore their own how they feel about something without it being necessarily out in the open and obvious so i mm. think i think that helps helps the whole thing yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Fabulous. So many things I'd love to ask you about this project, but I also want to ask you about your Edinburgh shows um, before we wrap up too, because you're both going to the Edinburgh Festival this year. I'd love to know what that sort of preparation process is looking like currently, uh, if anything, and uh, any any tips, because I've heard from multiple listeners actually who listen to the show, both in the UK and in the US, who haven't been to Edinburgh and are considering it and kind of want to know more about it and are interested in that in episodes. So I'd love to start with you, Satendraka, uh, because you've already been to Edinburgh. What's it looking like now, the preparation process and anything that you're kind of thinking of as we are in sort of May 2024, looking forward? Yeah, so this is my second show I'm taking up. And I debuted, so took up my first comedy show in August 2022, did the whole month. Glad glad I did it. And um, I think just going, turning up with a show, it's like a big shop window. People will come and see you. It will lead to things in your career. It's great. It's a great thing to do. Um, This time round, obviously, the accommodation has just skyrocketed in terms of price in Edinburgh. So I'm doing two weeks, the last two weeks. I'm not doing a full run. I'm with um, Hootenannies at Pottero. So for people who know mm. the Fringe, there used to be the Blunder Bus that sort of parked in the middle of Edinburgh, right by this underpass. And then you go into Bristow Square and you've got the Pleasance Dome and Underbelly and everything. And so they can't have the bus anymore. There's been sort of a law change. And so Hootenannies has taken over the sort of space and they're going to have two yurts. So I'm just going to be performing this big yurt by an underpass, which is the dream. And no, it's great. It's brilliant. And then basically Hootenanny's, um, one of the people who set it up is a guy called John Miller. He um, set up Monkey Barrel with some other people, I think. And so their thing is like a, a fair financial deal for artists because you can pay a lot to be 
in at the fringe and i certainly paid a lot with, um yeah. a lot more with my original venue so basically the artists don't pay up from because right now you have a lot of edinburgh bills coming in and you've you've got installments to pay for your venue and so on and um they basically take 20 percent off your tickets at the end and so that has made it much more affordable for me and that's something to think about for people who worry about the cost of the fringe i'm trying to do it as cheaply as i can because i'm in a, a worse financial position than i was two years ago i think a lot of us are um mm. and yeah just really seeing where i go from there and i i'm much more i'm sorry to say it's in front of the ring but like i'm much more relaxed because it's my second go and there's sort of this particular thing about debuting which i'm sure you can tell you about which is a bit more pressure mm. for me i feel the show is written now and it's just a case of like doing it and learning it obviously and i'll tweak it um I think it's it's taken me also two years to get here. So I didn't go in 2023. I think it's really important to note because there's this feeling you have to go every year, possibly some mm -hmm. pressure. Um, I don't have an agent or anyone like that. N nobody's telling me to go to Fringe. Nobody needs me there. It's fine. I'm choosing to go. <laughs> but um, I've taken two years and it felt it's felt right for my show and for my mental health and for my finances. And that's sort of what's worked for me. I don't think I'm the only person to do that. And it's something to think about just like, can you take the pressure off a bit, particularly if it's not your first show, and just make it easier on yourself? And I think I have done as much as I can to make it easier and a bit more fun. Um, but I'd say Noreen's is the more interesting story because she's debuting, and that's what a lot of people sort of worry about. So over to you. <laughs> yeah, no, but that that's really helpful advice, and I'm and uh, very wise. I'm sure provides great comfort, and also to people. Um, we've had other guests on the show again, and there is can be that pressure to be there every year. So great to kind of hear that more balanced view of it for people who. I think it's unsustainable want... these exactly. days. I think it's just it was what I was thinking. Doable ten years ago, maybe like I I would go as a. I've been going as a member of the audience since 2003 and accommodation is uh, the venue price maybe, but I, I wasn't aware of that, but the accommodation has rocketed. Um, yeah. It's, it's so much money that um, you, I have to think as well, like what can the audience afford and sort of mm. all the other people who are working like techs, flyers, all of them, how are they affording it? And so it's not, what does this become? So yeah, it's unsustainable. Um, every other year is probably, good enough for me while while it lasts so yeah i love it and there's room for all different things and noreen i'd love to hear your take too so yeah so i i mean i've been to edinburgh fringe as part of uh, the trio the dots and also yeah. my um franks and skinner duo so i i do i know it but like you were saying the the idea of going there as a debut the pressure and not only financially because it's so expensive as you were saying because at least before I was like, oh, yes, of course, we were splitting it in half or three ways. Um, so it took that level out. Um, and we also had were fortunate in those past years that we just happened to have got a good deal because maybe the venue thought that it wasn't going to do very well at that time. We wouldn't be able to. I think we I think when I was did Franks and Skinner, my comedy duo, we did a show at um, 11 a.m. And they mm. presumed that nobody would come. But actually, it was the perfect time because people didn't have any other shows that were competing. <laughs> nice. And we were offering tea and biscuits. So um, that was lovely. So to to kind of go up there, and I, I'm, I'm a very indecisive person. So this process has been quite tricky because me trying to make a decision about where would I do it, which venue, what image should I use? Um, oh, there's so many decisions to make and they all feel high pressured because I sort of feel like I want to give this one my all. You know, even if that means that, uh, I don't know, it doesn't go as well or, or, or it goes really well, I, I kind of trying to take that layer off, but just giving it my all, which means that um, I, I, was, I was saying uh, the other day, uh, this week, I, I've really found that the, ad, the admin of it is takes up so much time, whether that's a press release or uh, all the other festivals that you're doing for work in progress is to, to get there that sometimes the actual show and the content then takes a, a back seat. And um, that's my process at the moment is trying to find a balance between getting the show ready, getting the admin ready, and then also trying to work to earn the money that I need. Mm -hmm. to. <laughs> so it is really stressful. But at the same time, for, for anyone who's listening and thinking about it, I think it's it's such a if if you can and there's a way and there probably there are ways of doing it you know like as Sushantra was saying you know you can maybe do it on a on a cheaper way or, or however that works for you, I think it's an experience that um, 
you'll get so much from that regardless it's um even if you just do it the once or or whatever I, i'm really looking forward to what that brings and what that feels like when i'm there so yeah i'm excited about it it doesn't sound like it, but I am. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, well, that's great. And this is the, the show where people want to know all the real details as well as like you wouldn't be doing it unless you wanted to. So we know there's a huge love for the comedy there. And you've also talked in such a fun way about your uh, Traitors Project too. So, so many things I'd love to ask you, but we're coming up to time. So before um, we wrap up, is there anything else that we've missed that people should really know about you and your work? And if not, where can we go to find out more and obviously I'll put these links in the show notes and starting with Suchandrika. Oh um know about me and my work um uh, uh, my show doom scrolling at Edinburgh Fringe it's um me kind of speaking to my niece who's five or six mm-hmm. and trying to make sense of this current time so if that is something you're into <laughs> come on I'm getting yeah. lots of parents bringing like 11 to 13 year olds which I find oh. fascinating and they've been quite good audience members so I'll say like stuff I think that their generation's doing and then I'll check with them they'll be like yeah I'd never have like a a public um Instagram account and I'm like yeah yeah because you're much better at the internet than we are yeah yeah um so that's fun I've actually put it as a 12 years plus because um it's at 3 p.m mm. so I'm open to the people bringing youths um and I'll just deal with them being young. But yeah, so um, Doom Scrolling, you'll have a link, I'm sure. And um, come to the Liz Trusses the Traitors our show um, at Aces and Eights in North London on the 29th of May. And you'll have the link, I'm sure. It'll be very fun. I will. So I'll put both of those in. Amazing. And Noreen? Yeah, um, I suppose just the, the, the same. My, my show in Edinburgh is about me being um, sort of as Liz Truss and trying to find ways. What do I do next? And being an mm. indecisive person, I look at my childhood and explore that and use my other non-political characters to help me try and remove her from inside me, um, which is a strange sentence. Um, so yes, that's that's on just the tonic venues at two forty, um, and you can find all of, about me um, at Noreen Skinner on all of the social. Um, it's a weird spelling, N-E-R-I-N-E. Um, it's a very unusual name. Uh, so I, I don't mind if anyone calls me a different name. Um, and yes, come to Liz Trusses the Traitors um, on the 29th. It's going to be a really, really, really fun one. Oh, fabulous. Thank you so much today. So much I've learned and have to think about as we uh, go on our separate ways. And I hope you have tons of fun on the 29th and also in Edinburgh. Bye for now. <laughs>